Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I make it uh, quarter past five here in the UK, so I'm going to get started. Um, if you could all just give me a plus one or something in the chat uh, so I can see that you can all hear me and see a screen, which you should see the, uh, the title slide for this video. Good stuff. Thanks very much. So my name is Robin Moffat. Um, I work at Confluent um, as a developer advocate. I'm at Moff on Twitter if you'd like to follow me. Um, and today I want to talk about integrating uh, databases into Kafka, which kind of sounds simple enough. Um, and I guess we might want to start off by thinking about why do we even want to do it? Because databases and Kafka, like they don't necessarily obviously go together, but maybe by the end of this talk, you'll hopefully agree with me that they do kind of obviously go together. So people want to do it for different reasons. People want to hook up databases through Kafka to be able to offload their data somewhere else. So we've got transactional data in a database and we say, well, we're going to take this data and put it somewhere else, maybe for analytics purposes, go and put it into HDFS or uh, into S3 or something, somewhere like that. And we'll use Kafka to do it. So we've got that bit of the pipeline there, the database into Kafka that we want to be able to do. Maybe we want to take it a step further and say, well, we've got data flowing through Kafka that we're going to push down somewhere else. But we want to take data from a database to help us enrich events that we're getting from somewhere else. So we've written a service and it's pushing its events into Kafka, but we want to take those events and enrich them. Maybe we've got things like an order being placed and you want to say, well, we've got information about the customer and that's held in a database. So we could do lookups, you can do those joins within Kafka itself. So again, we're wanting to take data out of a database and stream it into Kafka. Or maybe we want to build applications that are going to move functionality away from an existing application. And most applications are built around databases in some way or another. So we say we've got an existing application, it's using a database, and we can capture what happens in that database. So it's a, a stock management system, and so it moves a piece of stock around, and under the covers in a database somewhere, something gets updated. Well, we can capture those events out of the database into Kafka and build new applications against it that way. So all of these different ways we're using databases and wanting to take that information into Kafka, whether to build new applications driven by events happening in the database, or whether we want to take events or data out of a database to build new applications. But we keep on talking about streaming these things and we keep talking about databases and databases certainly feel like lumps of data and kind of quite a long way away from streams of events, which is what we're talking about when we're talking about Kafka. But it turns out that events, which is what we're streaming, are actually all around us, whether we realize it or not. A lot of the data that we work with in a database actually starts life as an event. We just choose to store it in a database. And if we think about the fields in which we work and the businesses and the kind of the domains of data, we can easily think of lots of different events that are created by interactions with our business, humans interacting with our business. These are all events. And if you look at those things, you can probably think, well, I would put that in a database. But it starts life as an event. Something happened and what happened? That's what an event is. So someone buys something, they walk into a shop or probably nowadays they buy it online or we have some inventory and it moves around between warehouses. These, these are events and we can capture these events. Or we have machine generated events. We have things happening on firewalls and readings coming from IoT devices or applications that we're building also generate events. And then databases themselves are also a source of events. So we can take a database and think about it in terms of events. And like I said, it looks and it smells like a static lump of data. And we think we're querying a table. But if we think carefully about that data that we're working with, it's not necessarily quite so straightforward. If you imagine you've got a table, so obviously a very simple abstracted idea of a bank account table. So here's our table for the balance on a bank account. So for a given key, for a given uh, account ID, what's the balance? The balance is 50 euros. So select balance from uh, accounts where ID equals one, two, three, four, five. It's a database table. But how did that balance get there? Well, the balance got there because we put some money into the account. And then we put some more money into the account and now the balance has changed. If we go to the table and query the table, the balance has changed. And if we spend some money, the balance will change again. So if we look at these two things here, 
you can see you've got a table and what builds that table is a stream. So you can take a stream of events and you can play them and replay them over time to give you the state, which is what we hold in a table. So it's called the stream table duality because you go from a stream to a table. And it's called a duality because you can actually say, well, let's take things that happen to a table and capture those into a stream of events. So you can go kind of like back and forth and full circle with it. And based on this, we have this great quotation from Pat Helland. The truth is the log. The database is a cache of a subset of the log. All you actually need when you're working with data are the events, which you can capture in an immutable distributed commit log like Apache Kafka. And from that, you can replay those events either to drive an application based on things that have happened, or you can use it to build state. But all you actually need is this log of events. So this is why we might want to think about getting data from a database into Kafka and why it actually makes a huge amount of sense to be able to relate a database to Kafka because they're both sources of events or both ways of working with events. But how do we actually go about doing it? What are the bits and pieces that we need in our toolbox? So I'll have a pause for a drink and ask questions in the, uh, the chat box if you want to. I've got it open on a separate thing down here um, or I'll kind of like pause for questions at the end as well also. So the kind of things that we want to do or the, the, the tools that we're going to use in our toolbox for getting data from a database into Kafka, it's probably going to be based around Kafka Connect. So Kafka Connect is part of Apache Kafka. If you're using Apache Kafka, you already have Kafka Connect. So it's one of the APIs that was added quite a while ago now. I think it was version 0 0.10, but kind of like way back then. And it enables us to do streaming integration between systems upstream into Kafka and from Kafka downstream to other systems. So we can build ourselves end-to-end -end pipelines, shunting data from one source system or message queue or file or rest endpoint or anywhere else where we've got data and we can stream it into Kafka. And then from Kafka, we can stream it down to any number of other places. It's just configuration file to use. So you set up a bit of JSON that says, this is the connector that I would like to use, and then the appropriate information for that connector to work. So if we're connecting to a database, where is that database? Which tables would we like to ingest into Kafka? And Kafka Connect is a fantastically uh, designed uh, API, and it's modular. So it's based around the idea of connector plugins. And this is something that someone has gone and written, which describes how to integrate with the source or target technology. So it uses the appropriate APIs for that technology. So if we're talking to a database, one option would be using JDBC, but someone's actually written a connector that goes and speaks the JDBC to the database to get the data in. And we're gonna talk all about how it does that and our options around it in a moment. But this is kind of like the basics of Connect here. We've got a Connect plugin and it says, I'm gonna integrate with that particular technology. But then it hands off the actual piece of data to another piece within the framework because it's very modular for very, very good reasons. Because what we get from the source system, we now need to write to Kafka and we're gonna write it to Kafka as bytes because messages in Kafka are just bytes. We need to serialize it in some way. And that's where our converter plugin comes. So someone writes a connector plugin. They say, like, I'm gonna sort out getting the data from this source and I'm gonna bring that data in but then someone else could write a plugin which says, okay, I'm gonna take data that's come from somewhere that like the connector plugin person figured out how to do, and I'm gonna serialize that into a suitable way that we can store it in Kafka, but you can mix and match these things. You can use various different serialization methods. There, you can tell I've got kind of like opinions on this based on the emojis I've used there. When it comes to taking data, particularly when we're using Kafka Connect and building pipelines, schemas matter a huge amount. So if we just say, here's our payload of data, and we like the data says 42 and Fred, we want to know what those fields are, what are the data types, and are there any defaults, are there any fields missing, are they nullable, all that kind of stuff. We have a schema around it, because when we come to use that data, we need to know that. So something like Avro or Protoboff or JSON schema, these are great ways to serialize your data. JSON is like, so-so, it's like Grimace emoji, because you don't have an explicitly declared schema. 
you have like a string that you can eyeball and guess at what the schema is, but it's not explicitly declared. And thus it's not enforceable. So you end up with brittle pipelines. And CSV, like I hope you're kidding if you're suggesting that. So if you're gonna use something with strong support for schemas, you need somewhere to store those schemas. And one example is the Confluent Schema Registry. It's community licensed and it gives you somewhere for your schemas to reside. It provides serializers and deserializers. So in this example, Kafka Connect to say, I'm going to serialize that message using Avro, for example. Onto Kafka, we get a nice small binary payload. And then in the schema registry, store the actual schema itself. When we come to use the data, could be Kafka Connect, could be a, just a consuming application. The schema is available for use by the consumer. We read the message from Kafka, deserialize it, and now we have the schema. So we could say, well, we're taking data from one place and we're pushing it into HDFS, for example. Well, if we have the schema, we can go and build the Hive table on top of it because we have the schema. We can also do transformation work as part of the pipeline. And again, single message transforms are pluggable. So you can say, as the data passes through, drop these particular fields or change the data type of these. So single message transforms are really powerful. But it gives us a nice, extensible, powerful framework for building these integrations of getting data into Kafka and getting data from Kafka down to other places. You can get the connectors and plugins from various different places. One of those is Confluence Hub, so it kind of pulls them together. Um, you can go and search for a particular technology that you'd like to integrate with. Now let's think about our databases specifically. So uh, the reason I've spoken about Kafka Connect so much is that it's key to what we're doing because Kafka Connect is generally how you're going to build your integrations or generally how you should be building your integrations. I'm kind of strong with my opinions here and feel free to, to question or uh, challenge them. But in my opinion, Kafka Connect is the best default assumption for how you're going to do your integrations. Other ways exist. Kafka Connect is widely accepted as a very good way to do it. But now we need to think about, well, which connector plugin are we going to use? I mentioned GDBC earlier on. But that's not the only way in which to do it. And when it comes to getting data out of a database, we're going to use it's a, a kind of technique called change data capture, which people understand in different ways. So to start off with, I'm going to explain what I mean by change data capture. And in my view, there are two different types of change data capture. One is query based change data capture. I'm going to start saying CDC because I've only got 40 minutes. So query based CDC or log based CDC. Query-based CDC is based on the idea of querying the database to try and figure out what's changed since we last queried it. So we're going to pull the database and say, what's changed since we were last here? And we can do that based on a timestamp or based on an ID column that's incrementing each time. So we go to the database, we say, what changed since we last checked? This is, OK, these two rows here have changed. And then something else changes in the database. And we pull the database again. This is, OK, now there's this additional row has also changed. So we can extract rows from the database as they change into Kafka. That's query-based CDC. Log-based CDC is based on the database's transaction log or bin log or whichever flavor of database you're using, the log that the database internally writes stuff to when things happen. The log that if the database goes bang, you cross your fingers and cross your toes and hope that you've got a copy of because that's what you're going to recover the database with by rolling those transactions forwards and applying them to the database. So with log-based CDC, we're actually using that transaction log to take those events as they happen in the database and stream them into a Kafka topic. So if something happens in the database, we stream it over into Kafka. So let me show you these two in action. You can go and get the, uh, the demo that I'm going to show you uh, online. In fact, let me show you where it actually is. So here's my window here. Um, if I put it on the screen, you can see that. So there's a repository here called uh, Demo Scene. Am I sharing the right one? Yes, I am. So it's called Demo Scene, and there's a whole bunch of different uh, demos here. So one of them is this one called uh, No More Silos, and within it, it's actually got the step-by-step. -step. So because I'm not very good at memorizing things or live demos suck if the person keeps on fat fingering things, I'm actually just going to copy and paste from this, but it also means that you can follow it along and try it for yourselves. So it's based on Docker. So we've brought the stack up, and we're just going to check that everything is running. So if I do this and do that, we can see that's all working. And it says the Kafka Connect is running. So we're now going to check that our plugins have been installed correctly. 
So I'm going to share some links afterwards, including the slides. But one of them is a talk all about the kind of Kafka Connect and how you run it and Kafka Connect workers and all that kind of stuff. So that's not this talk. This talk is about databases. But we're going to use Kafka Connect. It has these plugins that I mentioned. And we can go to the worker and we can say, has it got the particular connectors that I want to show you? And it does. So now we're going to say, well, let's have a look at some data in a database that we want to pull into Kafka. So in our database, we've got some tables. Let me say show tables. It says you've got one called customers. So let's have a look at that customers table. So we can say describe customers. customers and it says there's your schema. So we've got things like an ID column and a first name, last name. We've got this one here, which is going to be important. When was the row last updated? And we can see it's got a default, and it's also got a thing on it which is going to update it automatically for us. And if we query the database, we've got five rows. It's just a small little table of information about our customers. So let's pull that into Kafka. And the first one we're going to do is we're going to use the uh, query-based change data capture. So this says I would like to use the, in this case, it's called the JDBC source connector. I'll go into the details of these at the very end. For now, we'll just talk about query-based CDC. We say, here is my JDBC connection, because we're using JDBC to talk to the database. Here's my credentials. Here's the particular table that I want to pull the data in from. And we hit enter. And it says, OK, I've created that, hopefully. And we can say sort. And we can see that it's actually uh, running that particular connector uh, here, like that. So that shows that particular connector it has been created and it's running. So that has taken a select against that source table and streamed it into Kafka, and now it's running. So now it's polling the database for any changes to that table. So we can go over to Kafka and we can say, show me the contents of that table, of that, sorry, of that topic. Topics tables, they're kind of interchangeable, they're data entities. And here I'm going to use Kafka Cat, which just acts as a consumer against the Kafka topic to pull in the data from this particular topic to which we stream the data. And I'm going to pipe it through JQ just to pretty print it on the screen so we can exactly see what's going on. So you can see we've got a bunch of different messages. So this message here is for customer five. And you can see that, that, sorry, that there, let me get my selections right, matches this here in the database. So database copied into a Kafka topic, which is kind of neat. But now let's see what happens if we insert a row in our database. So let's clear that there and insert a row into the database. And if you blink, you'll miss it over in our Kafka topic here. We've now got that row that was inserted into the database. And if I make a change in the database over here in my SQL, we're going to do an update. So paste that update in. And on the right hand side there, we can see we picked up that update. And if I page on the right hand side up through the topic and do that, you can see there was our insert and it had no email address. And we page down and we can see the next message. It did have an email address because in the database we did an insert and then we did an update. So that's using the query based change data capture. We're going to the database and we're pulling the database for changes. And it's based on this update timestamp field incrementing uh, so we can tell when things have changed. Now let's have a look at the log based change data capture. So I'm going to clear that uh, screen on the right hand side. We're going to create another connector this time. We're going to use the Debezium MySQL connector. Um, so here we're saying the MySQL connector. And here's how we connect to the, the uh, MySQL database. Here's the particular table that we'd like to ingest into our Kafka topic. So we go and create that. And we say sort and make sure that's running. And we can see we've got this one here, our source connector. Um, it says it's running, which is, again, good news. So again, let's go and have a look at the Kafka topic. And it's writing to a different Kafka topic this time. So we're using Kafka Cat against this Kafka topic that we're streaming the data to. Again, we're piping it through JQ. And this time, we see that we get a payload that we would expect. Here's Mr. Rick Astley, who's the, the rule that we updated and changed. But now we get a bunch more information. We get a bunch of metadata. We get all this lovely stuff here. So what was the version of the connector? What was the server it came from? Which was the table? What was the file bin log that it came from? What was the series, the SCN on the system? What operation was it? It was a create. So we're doing a snapshot against that existing database table. And if I now cancel that, so that topic on the right hand side, it's continually, it's going to show us any updates to that topic. If on the left hand side, we go and make some more changes to that database. And we're going to do this. 
So we're going to update Rick Astley again. So we've set his email address, and now we need to uh, fix the email address. So we're going to change the email address there. On the right-hand side, we've pulled that through, and you can see the operation was an update. And now here's where we get into the difference, the real differences between log-based and query-based. Because query-based says, this row changed, here is the row. Log-based says, I got an update, I got a, uh, an event in the database transaction log, here's what it is. And in the case of an update, it says, well, this row here is updated. And this is what it looked like beforehand. Let me just page down and show you that. This is what it looked like beforehand. Okay, so here is your email address. And this is what it looked like afterwards. And here is your email address. And by the way, here's all your other lovely metadata and where it was from the bin log and all the rest of it. And it was an update. So you can now build applications which are driven by when something changes in that source system, whether it underpins a third party application or whatever, you can say, this got changed, this got inserted, this got updated. What was the before? What was the after? We can do this. We can say, let's go to the customers table and make an update to the name. So we update the name to Bob and you can see you get another update through. We can also do this and this you can't do with a query based uh, CDC. We can say delete from customers. And over here in our Kafka topic, we've got a delete come through. And because it's a delete, it says, well, afterwards, it was null. It's been deleted. It's null. It doesn't exist. What was it before it got deleted? Well, this is the record that got deleted. So now we can build applications that say, well, regardless of if it got deleted upstream, we can actually capture those deletes and we can build really cool things with it. So let me head back over to the slides and we can talk about this just a little bit more. We've got to decide how we're going to choose between log-based and query-based. And we could go eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and that kind of suffices to start with, but soon we need to justify how did we choose each one. So let's take a bit more of a look at the differences between them. Query-based change data capture relies on the source schema having a field that we can use to identify what changed. So that either means adding a timestamp to the table, or it means adding an ID field to the table. And that ID field needs to go up each time. So the, the connector will say, is it greater than it was last time? So if you've got an ID column that gets created and like increments each time, you're going to capture all of your uh, inserts because it's going to go up, so it'll be a new one. You won't capture your updates unless that ID field increases when we do an update. So a timestamp is a much more obvious one. You have a field in a table which says, when was it last updated or when was it created? And so you can base your uh, polling based on that. So a row gets inserted. We can capture that because we can compare it to the timestamp previously. A row gets updated. We can capture that because, again, the update timestamp is greater than it was previously. A row gets deleted. We can't capture that because how can you go to a database and say, select all the rows that don't exist? Well, you can't. You'll get kind of like, well, no rows were found because they don't exist anymore. So here's a big difference. Query-based change data capture, you can't capture deletes. Here's another more subtle but equally important difference. If we're polling the database, there's going to be an interval in which we're not querying the database for things that have changed. So let's say we've got a 30-second poll uh, on our connector, and we do a select against the, the orders table, and we say, what order's been created in the last 30 seconds? And it says, well, here's this one, order, I 40, order ID 42, it's been shipped, it was last updated at uh, 10.54 and 29 seconds. You say, okay, great, we've captured the event. But if you actually think about how that event could have come about, how that row could have come about, maybe at one second past the minute, so like just after we last polled, we're polling every 30 seconds, it got created. So the order was created and it was pending and we didn't have an address associated with it. And then another application comes along and it updates the address. So this is our second change to the table. And then another system comes along and says, well, actually, I kind of need to retro change this data. Now we change the data again. And then finally, we ship it and we change the data again. Well, all of these things have happened to the data, yet when we poll the table every 30 seconds, we only get to see the last one. You don't catch those intermediate events. You may not care. You may simply say, I just want to make sure that whatever the table currently looks like is what I have currently in my topic. But you may say, I would like to build an application that if someone changes the address on an order, I need to rerun the fraud detection. Or when an order moves from pending to shipped, 
I need to go and ring a bell somewhere and do something based on that event happening. And if we're using query-based change data capture, we cannot capture all of those events. We could make the polling frequency uh, more often and say, like, let's poll the database every second. But you can imagine what that's going to do to your scalability and also to your DBA's temper, because you say, well, what are you doing to my database? You're polling it all this time. And also, even within a second, stuff's going to happen. Things get updated automatically. So we simply cannot guarantee that we capture every event. So it's generally easier to set up. It's a great one for prototyping and setting up systems where we're simply saying, let's see what we can build if we've got data from this database in Kafka. It's great for that. But when it comes down to the nitty gritty, it doesn't actually do everything you need it to. So it's certainly easier, but you're going to find if you're building event-driven applications, certainly that log-based change data capture is a more solid option because it gives you the fidelity of the data that query-based doesn't. Or put another way, it's simply a more refined way of capturing your data. So log-based change data capture, as we mentioned, it works against the transaction log of a database. So as something happens in the database, a user does an insert, they do an update, they do a delete, they commit the transaction, that database writes it down to the log first and then flushes it to the data files. The log in the database, as any DBA will know, is supremely valuable, important. You really hope you don't lose that because if you lose it, you cannot rebuild your database back to a given point in time. You just have to roll back to kind of like a snapshot backup. Database logs that roll back and forwards because they capture a stream of events that happened in the database. And you can apply that stream of events. And you may well start to see parallels between how Kafka gives us that fundamental ability of building a commit log on which we can build other things. Whereas databases are based on a commit log, and then they say, and now here's your state on top of it. So something happens in the database, we do an insert, we capture that into Kafka, we do an update, it gets written to the transaction log, we can capture that into Kafka. We do a delete, something gets deleted from the database, that's still something that gets written to the transaction log, and because it's written to the transaction log, we can also capture it to Kafka. So there is this parallel between a database which is built on a commit log and like takes that and says, well, here is an API, it's called SQL, and here's all these different ways of working with your data and querying it and so on. Kafka says, I am a distributed immutable commit log. Go and build cool things. So Kafka gives us those fundamentals. There's, there's this great talk by Martin Kleckman about the database inside out. And Kafka gives us those fundamentals of a distributed commit log on which we can build super cool things. So log-based change data capture, it gives us much greater fidelity on the data. It's lower latency because we're going against a transaction log. We're not polling the database. And because we're not polling the database, we've got a lower impact on the source. It needs more work setting it up. And you usually need to go and talk nicely to, D to your uh, DBA team because you usually need uh, enhanced privileges to do so because it's a lower level operation. And then here's the bit that kind of like can stick in the throat. Depending on the database which you're querying from, often there's costs associated with log-based change data capture tools. Not always, but sometimes. So how do we decide which one we're going to use? We can use, if we're using query-based change data capture, then the Kafka Connect uh, source connector um, is kind of the, the de facto one. Um, it's community licensed from Confluent. You can go and download that, and you can use that. If you want to use log-based change data capture, it all gets a little bit more murky. There are commercial tools available. There are some great open source tools available. Debezium is kind of like the leader of the pack by far. It's amazing. And they're developing loads of different connectors. So there's Postgres, there's MySQL, there's Mongo. Uh, I saw Gunnar, one of the authors of it, on the chat, so he'll tell me which ones I've missed. They've also got SQL Server. There's uh, Oracle um, in beta. So there's loads of different connectors within it. It's a very, very good tool. Um, as I say, there are other proprietary ones. Oracle Golden Gate, people have heard of, um, if only because it's kind of infamous, but it's also very, very good at what it does. But there's loads of different options when it does come to uh, log-based change data capture. So I think, by my reckoning, I've got 10 minutes until the end of this. I'd love to do some questions, but I want to show you one more example of what we can do with this. I showed you this slide earlier where I talked about this idea of enriching streams of data. And I want to show you this because people sometimes think of Kafka as just a DOM pipeline. It's like it's a super scalable and flexible and brilliant pipeline, but they just kind of like set their horizons understanding of Kafka as like, well, I can use it for shunting data from here to here. Kafka has built in stream processing capabilities. 
but Kafka Streams API as part of Apache Kafka. So we can say, here is a topic with an event, like maybe some ratings or some orders were left. And we can say, well, I would like to enrich that and push that downstream or make it available downstream. I want to build a real-time dashboard. I want to have an application that's got access to this enriched data rather than an application which has to consume the raw data and then do its own lookups out to a database and it gets messy and laggy and so on. So we can actually say, well, let's pull the data from a database into Kafka and then we can do our stream processing within this. So I'm gonna show you another demo. In this case, I don't code Java. So to those who do, my apologies. I'm gonna use a tool called KSQL DB. It's community licensed from Confluence, but it's an abstraction on top of Kafka Streams. So I'm showing you, you can do with Kafka Streams. I'm gonna cheat and use a SQL based interface though. So again, the um, examples for this are on um, uh, the GitHub repository. Again, I'll share the links for it afterwards. And what we're gonna do here is if I close this window and come out of this one, and we're gonna say ksql h, and this is gonna bring us into a ksql db command prompt. So ksql db, as the blurb says, event streaming database, blah, blah, blah. It's built on top of Kafka streams, and it lets you express the streaming transformations that you want to do on your data using SQL. So to start off with, we're gonna create ourselves an object which sits on top of our stream of data that we got through from Debezium. So we're taking this Kafka topic here, it's in Avro. Because it's in Avro, we have the schema. Okay, remember how I talked about how schemas are super important? They're super important to people who want to use the data. And presumably we're not just collecting data for the heck of it, we want to use the data. So I'm a user, I come along, I've got appropriate permissions to access the topic. I say, I'd like to create a stream against this topic. So KSQL DB says, well, I can do that. And I have the schema because you use Avro. So I can go to the schema registry, pull down the schema. Same with Protobuf, same with JSON schema. And here we can see, here is my schema. We've got the before and after, which is a struct, a, a nested object with a particular payload within it. We've got information about the source. We've got information about the operation. And now that we have a schema on top of the data, we can query the data. So let's say select star from the customer's CDC stream. Um, and it changes, show me everything that's happening in that topic. And it says, okay, here's the contents of that. And because it's a nested thing, that's kind of not so useful to look at. So let's say, let's select the operation and the after uh, first name. Okay, there's, it was a create and then it was an update and it was a delete. But because we have the before and after, we could actually say before first name. And here we can see this one here, this update, actually change the first name. So you can see the before and after, you get the delta between it. This one here, the deletion, it was this and now it's null. Why is it null? Because we deleted it, it doesn't exist anymore, but we, because we're using log-based change data capture, we actually capture the before record. We can do another thing using Kafka streams, and in this case, case equal DB, we can actually materialize a view of the state. So you know I talked at the beginning about how databases are actually based on events. Well. Kafka gives you the commit log, and then using Kafka streams or KSQL DB, you can actually take those events and replay them and rebuild the state. So here I'm gonna say create myself a table within KSQL DB called customers, and it's gonna hold the current state of our customers. So if I create that, and then I open up another tab here, which is gonna be for my SQL, and we say select uh, these from the table, so select, select that from customers. What's the current state in our customers table of ID 42? And we're gonna go and do the same thing in case equal BB. It says, well, there is your current state. It's got ID 42, that's the first name and the last name and the email. Let's go to MySQL and let's say, well, that, I'm sure it's not called uh, Bob, I'm pretty sure it's called Rick. So let's go along here and say, well, let's fix that in the source database. So I'm using SQL, but any application is going to write into my SQL database, writes it to the transaction log, goes over to our Kafka topic. Our Kafka topic is read by our stream processor, Kafka Streams, so or in this case, KSQL DB. We say, well, what's the current state of that table? It says, well, the current state is now this. But because we're using a Kafka topic, which captures all of our events, we can rebuild the state into a materialized view like this that we can query, but we can also do this. Let me show you this. And we can say, well, show me those stream of changes. So ID 42, 
First off, they got created and the email address was this. And then we made an update and the email address was this. And then we made an update and the first name changed. And then we made another update and it was like this. So by capturing your stream of events, you can actually do both things. You can have an audit of all of the things that happened and you can go back and replay those and how many times did they change email address? When was the last time they moved house and so on? But you can also say, I would like to query that and know what the current state is. And you can use that current state to join to streams and so on. And in saying that, I've remembered the point of that demo was supposed to be joining it. So let me briefly show you that because I got carried away with materializing my state. So here we're going to create ourselves a stream of ratings. So like people leave ratings, something was good, it was bad against the topic. And we can query that and it shows it's working. And we've got a live feed of data, people saying something was good, it was bad, and it's got a user ID field. So we're going to join this stream of events that's being produced by a producer API somewhere. And we're going to create ourselves a stream of enriched ratings. So we're going to do a join. So this is just using SQL create a stream as the results of this select statement. So select the rating and information about our customer from ratings in a joint customers, in a joint our customers table. So we go and create that. And we can say select star from ratings enriched. And it changes. It says, there you go. There is your ratings as they come in. Here is the user who left that rating and the star rating and so on and so on. And all of this under the covers is actually just a Kafka topic. So we say print this topic, just to act as a consumer against that topic. And it says, here is, let's pause that, here is that topic. And if I unpause it, so 1651 UTC, we're on um, uh, BST over here still, so an hour ahead. This is a live stream of events arriving on a topic, going through that select, doing the join out to the current state of customers and writing down to a new Kafka topic. So we could take that Kafka topic and consume it with an application. We could take that Kafka topic and push it down somewhere else like Elasticsearch or wherever else using Kafka Connect. So I hope that's been useful. I hope that kind of filled out some of the gaps in like the different types of CDC and how do you choose which type of CDC. I'll put all of the slides for this on the chat straight after this. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, at Armoff. I'll be sharing the slides and all the resources there. You can get a great set of books, uh, download them from that uh, link for free, scan the QR code, uh, all about Kafka, about the principles of logs and why they're so important. If you want to learn more Kafka, go along to developer.confluent.io. You'll find a bunch of tutorials and podcasts and videos and so on there. I'll share these links afterwards, just other talks that I've done if you want to learn more about Kafka Connect or things about KSQL DB or stream processing and all that kind of stuff there. With that, thank you very much. Um, and I'll head over and see if there have been any questions. Marta says, do you have any uh, idea of how to deal with rollbacks when using log-based change data capture? No, I have no idea. I'd be delighted for, for your inputs uh, if anyone else has got suggestions. Um, I just built these like Hello World demos, which kind of good enough to get you to there. And then all the like the nitty gritty and like devil in the detail of using it for real, that's what other people can figure out. Um, I'm being slightly flippant, um, but in this case here, I've not actually gone into that scenario, but it's obviously a super important one because then you've got uh, consistency and things like that to worry about. Um, okay, thanks, Gwena, you've, you've answered that one. Um, do you have any tips how to handle the right to be forgotten requirements when data needs to be deleted from a Kafka topic that captures the data from database? Yeah, so, right to be forgotten, GDPR over here, all sorts of different legislation saying, well, this fantastic immutable uh, commit log of events that you've got that you can kind of like go back in time and replay these things, that thing that's immutable, it now needs to be immutable, you need to get rid of that particular thing there. There's different approaches. Kafka topics have a retention policy that you can set to based on time or size, like um, um, size on disk, or something called compaction. Um, so you can also say to retain it forever, and that's commonly used with compaction, where you say for every single key, I would like to keep the latest value of that key. And if you send a null value for that key, it acts as a tombstone and it gets deleted. So if you're using compacted topics, that's one approach. You send a null for that particular user and thus they get forgotten when the compaction next runs. Another option is to use um, uh, crypto shredding, I think is the term, where you basically use keys associated with each user. And if that user wants their data to be lost, you basically ditch those, those um, uh, encryption keys 
um, and which means you can never decrypt it unless it's logically forgotten. So those are the two kind of approaches. Kafka Summit has had some really good talks about that particular subject. So go and check out Kafka Summit recordings. You'll find them on Google. Um, and there's a bunch of really good talks around that kind of specific thing. Okay, I think I'm pretty much at time. So I'll turn off my camera and, and whatnot now and hand over to the next person. But I'll stay on the chat room. Uh, I'll be on the streaming Slack channel uh, as well. And also, you can always find me on Twitter. Shameless plug, head over to my YouTube channel as well and subscribe there. There's a ton of Kafka Connect talks in particular there. So thank you very much and have a great day, everyone.